Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today is a very, very, very special episode uh, because we are talking about a lost drum kit of Gene Krupa that has been found and restored and is back in the world. So uh, today we have two special guests. First, our old friend of the podcast who's been on many times, maybe maybe one of the most uh, returning guests of the show, Mr. Brooks Tegler. Brooks, welcome back on. Glad to be here. <laughs> yes. And then we are also joined by Steve, who is the uh, owner of this drum set, who won it at an auction. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Hi, nice to meet you all. This is groundbreaking stuff because this is this has been announced to the world before on some, as Brooks said, like the Gene Krupa, like Facebook page and stuff. But really, this is kind of the big announcement to the world. So um, without further ado, Steve, let's start with you and jump in here and just tell us the story of how did this all happen? You know, how did you find out about it? How did you acquire this rare Gene Krupa full drum set? Uh, yeah, so it was, uh, somebody posted on, uh, uh, the vintage drum forum, uh, that there was an auction going on that had, uh, a couple kits, uh, of significance, one being, a you know, a support, a supposed Gene Krupa drum kit. And there was another drum set that, uh, appeared to be, a uh, Ed Shaughnessy kit. Uh, and it was... Just really kind of strange because you know these are two very well-known drummers uh the rest of the auction was a few other drum sets so nothing of any significance and then a bunch of lawn art uh that and then personal you know household effects posters pictures kitchen items just your kind of average uh stuff yeah uh the drums weren't really advertised at first. They were listed as a uh, drum set with GK on it. Um, and then the Ed Shaughnessy had, you know, says ES on it. Uh, and then over time, uh, after a few days, I, I don't know, people reached out to them or whatever, but they uh, started updating the descriptions and then they uh, made the, you know, they, they stated Gene Krupa and Ed Shaughnessy, but they never at any time said this belonged to they were you know just very matter of fact this is what they say on them but we're you know they weren't trying to say this was gene's drum set because they hadn't um, authenticated just to kind of throw that right. in. you said supposed yeah. which that does happen which we'll hear more yeah. from brooks here about oh, that but yeah for sure yeah and they uh you know this, this was not a an auction house that dealt with vintage drums they were just a standard place that liquidates an estate so they did the best they could and uh at first i thought oh man this thing might go for next to nothing because it's so under the radar here they're not you know it's not being you know it's not on some you know huge auction site or anything like that it's just you know, it's just a beat up old drum set yeah um as time went on it's like well i guess that's not really going to happen but uh, it seems still like, you know, it's probably still going to be under the radar enough that i might be able to actually afford this. So, um, you know, I watched it every day at first, it, the first pictures were like cell phone pictures, you know, it looked like just a white drum set with a GK head on the front. And it's like, I don't remember Gene ever playing just a plain white kit. Um, then they posted a few new pictures. Uh, that were a little clearer and by then you could see it was actually white mar you know white marine pearl yeah. and by then i'd already been digging around it's like this thing has some weird features on it first that head um that slingerland arch uh at the top was not something they ever you know produced for the public so only a handful of drummers uh you know ever had a head with that on there uh sometime you know Brooks can speak more to the the timeline, but it was sometime in the you know later part of the fifties and, and, and into the early sixties that you know some of the Slingerland's well known artists had this type of head on there. So sure, you know it's like that stands out. Um, but you know people can make reproductions. You know things like that happen all the time. Um, another detail about it is the spurs. Instead of being mounted on the front, 
they're mounted on the back of the bass drum. And they're a, a, a style that uh, actually WFL and uh, I guess maybe maybe once Ludwig bought the name back, they were using it. Yeah. Before they came out with the modern die cast parts that we all know and love. But so it's like, that's an unusual detail. Um, sure. And then so I, as I'm looking around on the Internet, uh, you know, I'm seeing pictures. It looks like this set, you know, the head matches, uh, the, the uh, spurs are in the right place. It's got the same little old fashioned uh, bent steel Tom bracket or uh, Tom leg bracket. So it's like all these details are matching up. So it's like, hey, this might actually be this set. Yeah. Um, well, in the, if, if it wasn't, it, it could very easily be a period correct drum set of a Gene Krupa enthusiast, which there's exactly. nothing wrong with that. They would they would paint right. their own head. But real quick, I want to ask, are these photos that we're looking at of the drum set in the yard? Are those the ones that you saw on the posting? Yep. OK. And the, and the ones the worst, that everybody saw. The ones that everyone saw yeah. in the posting. Okay. The worse, the worse the pictures are, the earlier they are. Got it. Because um, to explain for people who are just listening and not on YouTube, I mean, we're looking at like just like it's a pile of drums with busted heads in the yard amongst a bunch of other stuff. Uh, missing heads, busted heads. It's got the GK badge with the two lines in the badge that we all know and as steve said slingerland clearly hand painted across the top in a bit of an arch and a really worn head so i mean if you it's weren't looking close worn. you would just scroll right past this i mean it could be on an you know facebook marketplace or craigslist and just look like i mean we would look at it because we're drummers but it just looks like any old drum set it's interesting right and anybody you know that's young it's they're not uh, who's gk so yeah uh, you know, it's just very under the radar. So, so the more I look, then I start seeing these pictures and another detail I'm looking for, which I can't really see very well in these pictures was on that rack, Tom, that 13 inch Tom, there's two, two, uh, sound King lugs that have been replaced by snare lugs because it's a bolt on same hole spacing, all that kind of stuff. It's like, well, that's really an odd detail. You're not going to see that. So finally, they posted enough updated pictures and it's like, there they are. There's a, and it's like, but then again, still, these are all things somebody could have done themselves in their basement or, or whatever, just as a tribute kit or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are some people that obviously have nefarious intent to try to sell things sure. as the real item, but, uh, you know, so you always have to, treat that stuff with suspicion. Okay, here's my checklist. These things are all lining up. I'm not finding any old pictures that don't match these details, but the proof in the pudding is looking at the wrap. Yeah. Because white marine pearl is, it's like a fingerprint. You know, no two drums are going to have the exact same pattern on them. Because the way white marine pearl is made, it's made in a block. Uh, all these different colors, uh, textures of the plastic that it's made out of are kind of woven together and twisted together um, and then solidified as a block. And then they slice a thin layer off. They laminate a white backing on it or a colored backing. If it's black marine pearl, it might have a black backing. But yeah. white marine pearl is going to have a white backing. And then they laminate a clear laminate on top. So it's a sandwich. Every time you slice that, it's going to be different. So, I mean, and then on top of that, even if you did two slices and they were close, which they're not, they're still going to be quite different. But even if they were close, the chances of two identical drum sets being built with taking sequential numbered wrap off the stack yeah. cutting them the exact same place for the same exact size drums and one is played by gene krupa <laughs> right <laughs> it's like you it know, becomes and not to mention that floor tom is a 20 by 20 yeah. which not exactly something you see every day no. so you know so that's really the without a, any provenance so to speak the wrap is really going to be the proof so yeah. there was enough pictures posted towards the end that i I got a good enough feeling that this was actually the kit. Man. It's really that, that set. 
So I, you know, had already talked to my wife about, you know, what I was thinking of doing and she didn't talk me off the ledge or anything. And we discussed, you know, money and all that stuff. And so I had to go ahead and, uh, waited to the last minute and, and bid on it. And, um, as I, when I hit the bid button, I'm like, oh man, what have I done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause you know, I haven't seen it in person. Uh, I haven't seen really great shots of the wrap. I've seen enough pattern yeah. matches in there that I'm pretty sure. But, you know, until you see it and really know for a fact, it's like, you know. Yeah. So it's like, oh, man, it's like, oh, well, I'm not going to win this anyway. Somebody's going to swoop in at the last minute. Well, I turned out I won it. So. Um, oh, man. Well, you must have been. I mean, what? Uh, this is a weird question, but like, was this midnight that, that, that was over? Or was it like noon? Was it the middle of the night? You know, it was it was, I, it was in the evening. OK, um, yeah. OK, know, it's like seven or eight. <laughs> oh, that's good, because sometimes like that, yeah. they end at weird times, depending on where you are. But you had to just be were you pump, were you thrilled? I mean, you had to be pumped when you won this thing or maybe a little scared. It was a little both. Yeah, it was like I went in the bedroom and said, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, really? Uh, wow. So, you know, but then it was like that all that doubt is like, God, man, what if I get up there and this thing is not it? This is some fake or or just a tribute kit. And um, or what if it's, you know, it's clearly had been not stored very well, and sure. had water damage and stuff. So what if I get up there and this whole thing's just falling apart and it's, you know, not playable or not even, you know, worth anything? So, you know, it's like, well, I've done it now. I don't <laughs> yeah, have any choice. You I'm bought gonna, it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my son and I hopped in the car the next morning. And, uh, you know, that was another thing I'd figured out. Okay, this is this is kind of at the limit of what can be driven. Uh, yeah. In one wake cycle uh, with some adrenaline and some coffee. So uh, we hopped in the car and... Um, and headed up on up there uh you know it was dark when we left it was really dark when we got back so <laughs> it was a long day yeah um but you know the whole way there it's like oh god what have i done oh this is gonna be awesome what have i done this is gonna be awesome <laughs> um so we get there and you know i had already apparently a lot of people had already found this house online uh beforehand and i did too i had already researched there was one picture on the auction site that had the street number on the front of the house and the little town where it was in is very small mm. i was like well hey let's go on google maps and see if i can find it yep. um and when i found it on google maps it was no doubt because on the auction listing was all this lawn art this house was uh, a little local uh landmark this gentleman had a, a huge collection of, uh, you know, there was a, I don't know, a 10 foot Sasquatch and a bear, wow, and a, cool. a big pilot fish. And I mean, just all <laughs> kinds of things. And he would, the whole front of his house was covered with this stuff. And then when you go back behind it, there was even more back there and he would rotate it out. So, you know, this house was well known for that. It wasn't known for what lurked inside as far as this guy's drum collection. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so when I got there, I kind of felt like I'd already been there cause I had driven it on street view. So I go around back and, uh, you know, there's this garage in the back and there's all the, ev everything, all the drums are in there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just your average, you know, not finished off garage, quite dirty and everything. And there's a gentleman there picking up the uh, Ed Shaughnessy kit. Uh, we spoke a little bit. He offered to buy the set from me. He was one of the other three. I mean, it was me, Brooks, and this other gentleman were kind of hitting the bid button at the last minute. And yeah, uh, so he uh, he said he had some Gene Krupa stuff, and any and you know. So anyway, it was, we had a nice little chat, and uh, I looked at the Shaughnessy set, and it it looked legit. Still had the heads on the front of the bass drums and, you know, he had apparently two or three kits stored, you know, geographic different areas. So didn't have to ship them cross country. So this is one of his, uh, backup kits. So, cool. um, 
So, you know, I walk into the garage or he says, there's your stuff over there. And I look and there's in the corner sitting on the floor, like sitting on some cardboard is this kit along with there's another another drum set in, included and some odds and ends. Just it was a lot. Uh, there was a remote drum set and some just miscellaneous stuff. So I didn't buy it for that. I buy it for this set. You didn't buy this for the Remo. <laughs> no, <laughs> drum no set. did not. Uh, so, you know, I kind of look over there and it's just, you know, sitting over there and it's like, man, I hope that, you know, I don't know where this thing's been stored, you know, knowing that it's had some water damage, but so I went over and kind of looked it over. It's like, you know, I mean, it looks, looks legit, but then, you know, I looked at certain, I looked at the strainer on the snare drum and the chrome looked really good in the dark there. And I was like, it looked a little too good. I was like, man, you know, yeah. it's just like that doubt. You You're know, skeptical. Though. It's like, you yeah. can't let yourself be too excited right. because you could, the disappointment could be, uh, right. financially and just, emotionally not good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, I looked it over, like, let's look in the bass drum because, you know, in the pictures I could tell that the, the front bass drum head had gotten wet. Uh, there's like a lot of mold staining on it. Uh, it looks all wrinkly. The scarf joint is busted on the uh, front hoop. Um, so clearly it was, you know, sitting face down somewhere where it got a, in, in some water. Yep. So I knew there was some, you know, damage related to that. It's like, I bet that front re-ring is half off or all the way off. Stuck my head in the bass drum and sure enough, it's just, you know, floating in midair. Yeah. But it, nothing looked like it was irreparably damaged. Um, it was all the correct sizes. Everything, you know, I didn't see any details that didn't match what I was expecting. Mm. Um, but, you know, still, like, man, until I get this thing home and start literally looking at the wrap, I'm not going to know. And I'm not, I don't have time to do that here. Yeah. And, uh, and you already bought so, it. There's no going back at ahead. that point. So, yeah. It, yeah, at this point, yeah, I'm not gonna. I can't get my money. Back. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, I've either got Jean's kit or I've got a fairly nice, uh, proper, you know, uh, 54, 55 uh, Slinger lens set. Yep. And some miscellaneous stuff. I maybe could sell it all and get you know most of my money back, but you know, sure, it is what it is. Yeah. So, yep. bagged it all up, wrapped it all in plastic, throw it in the carefully threw it in the vehicle and, you know, head on back home. And then the, the whole way back, same thing. What have I done? This, you know, this is awesome. What have I done? So uh, I got home, unloaded the vehicle. Uh, we were actually planning on going out of town the next day. So I unloaded, stowed it all away and, and didn't unpack it. Like, I don't want to know yet. <laughs> I, I want to take some time here and just not think about it. Yeah. So, Spent a week on vacation, came back, and then started digging into it. Took the 13 inch out, uh, took it outside, and because these things were musty and dirty, there was uh, white stuff growing on all the calfskin heads. And sure, uh, you know, so so I start looking and start looking at pictures. Like, yeah, I'm seeing details here that that you know I'm seeing matches here. But so in the meantime, I had reached out to you. Yep. Uh, seeing if I could get in touch with Brooks because I've listened to uh, you know all the the GK uh, um, podcasts y'all have done, and yeah. so I knew Brooks was you know he's the man. But I, I will say that my uh, when I get that, of course, even you're saying you had doubt. My getting that email was like, so you emailed me saying, "Can I get Brooks's info? I think I have a, a, a drum set that I need to get authenticated." My in my mind, I'm thinking, "There's no way." <laughs> You know what yeah. I mean? Of course, it's it's yeah. so rare that it would actually be a real deal drum set. And I was like, but of course, I was like, you know, I don't think Brooks would mind. He, he enjoys this stuff. But he's Brooks, as, as he can say, when we get to that part, is he's seen a lot of fakes. So I was when this ended up being that like, oh, no, this is real. I couldn't believe it that, you know, it, it all worked out. But anyway, yeah. So you you got my you got the info from me about Brooks. And yeah. Yeah. So I reached out to Brooks and uh so I start, you know, we start a conversation and I start sending him pictures and, um, you know, he, you know, he, he told me that he had been bidding on it too. And, 
uh, you know, it's like, oh, wow, uh, sorry. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I start taking, you know, sending him as many pictures because I want, you know, he's documented all this stuff. He was involved with that, the big 2018 find. And, you know, I want him to have as much documentation of, of this set as possible. And uh, so I start trying to get pictures to send to him. And it was like, I'm just not capturing it on, you know, just not capturing. It. I can see it in person, but to actually capture it where somebody can yeah. say, oh, yeah, that's a match. So I played around with it using my phone, using different lights and everything. Finally, I just kind of said, well, I guess I need what I need to do is I need to duplicate as close as I can the position that the original camera was in and where the flash was and where the angle of the drum. Yeah, because to explain a little bit, I think Brooks will attest to this more. Authenticating stuff like this is usually comparing an original photo of Gene playing the drums to, you know, lineup markings, white marine pearl fingerprint, as you said, uh, there's a, you know, this lug is missing here. It's, it's marking that that's typically the way to authenticate these things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, if, especially if it's Marine Pearl, yeah, technically it's Marine Pearl white. The word white was added much later. Gotcha. Um, okay. I stand corrected. But, but yeah, I mean, I used the, the very first time I used the fingerprint method was in, uh, 19, oh, brother. 94 i guess uh to actually prove that a drum was not a croupa drum mm. it was easier because there were good pictures of you know present and shots of uh that particular snare from gene yeah um and yeah it's unmistakable the whole the whole idea that each one is going to be unique because of the pattern of the pearl sure um yeah is a perfect way if you can biggest problem i'm still working on that for a six and a half inch snare that i have now finding decent photographs the From older it then. gets yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a problem i've got yeah. right here in front of me i've got eight pictures of gene playing one of his six and a half inch snares none of the pictures show the marine pearl clearly enough that i can make a comparison to the one that's sitting in my bedroom floor that I'm hoping and against hope actually was one of Gene's. Yeah. So, you know, that's, and I've been, I've been looking at that now for over a year and a half. Wow. So yeah, but the fingerprint yeah. thing is essential. Absolutely. Okay. okay. So Steve, you're, you're then your method now is angling things. I mean, I, I mentioned it before with one of my other conversations with Brooks about this is like some like court document stuff. I mean, you're trying to get like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you have his yeah. book and everything, but uh, so how'd that process go? Well, so after I kind of figured out the best way to capture it, um, and also I put the, the camera on a tripod because I was trying with my, you know, it's like yeah, it's tough. too many ball, too many variables here. So I got it on tripod like, okay, this looks as close as I can to, you know, and, uh, and then I remembered I had an old Kodak, uh, halogen light that would have gone on a brownie. Sure. Uh, eight millimeter <laughs> camera. Yeah. Smart. So, you know, proper vintage. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm like looking through the camera and, and then also I thought these pictures are not perfectly clear. It's originals. Yeah. So try to get it as close to out, the same amount of out of focus as possible. Smart. So I start just clicking away, holding the light, you know, kind of seeing if I can see it. And then I go up and I pull the SD card out and I put it in my computer and I start looking. And I've got some of those white, the, the color pictures um, that uh, there's like, you know, eight of them or whatever that Brooks uh, 
provided you and I had some yep. some copies as well, which have really good clear, they're slightly blurry, but really good pictures. So just to say what we have here, you did the uh, snare drum with a really nice angle, very matching uh, from Universal Studios 1955 to match. You've got the floor tom, the giant floor tom, which was uh, Basin Street East, New York City, 1950 something, uh, which looks like a very accurate match. The, the Oslo Norway bass drum picture, it's cool to see this because you see the line of where the rap meets, right. which I'm sure yeah. that's not the biggest dead giveaway, but that's certainly... Although I, I have used fun. that as well. Yeah. I've used that as, as a marker of authenticity. Definitely. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a checklist. It's, you know, everything I'm looking at here, The because when I could even see that in the pictures on the auction site, the rap seam is in the right place. Yeah, because you can kind of me- you know with your visually measure between the distance from lugs right. and know kind of what neighborhood you're in and then you've got tom which was used in the benny goodman story which we're going to get to this i think with with brooks but when i started seeing the photos of what this drum set has been featured in where it's been okay. performed what the book covers and things it's like this is not some like you know he bought it in 1972 and he died the next year kind of thing it's like oh no this is the real deal uh, drum set. So anyway, yeah, very cool. You did a great job authenticating. So then after that, what happened? I mean, at that point, I was at least the stress of, okay, I didn't blow a bunch of money on uh, on this on this stuff here. Um, so, you know, I just each, you know, for about a week there, I was taking another drum out of out of wrapping and cleaning and looking, you know, checking condition and looking, you know, checking details. Um, you know, and overall, it's in surprisingly good shape. Um, you know, I mean, this thing has been all over the world. Uh, I mean, it was all over the U.S. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, in a, a, a lots of parts of Europe. Yep. Uh, Norway. I mean, he toured. He he, he must have just gotten it or it only had it for a month or so. Uh, he and, and the trio went to Australia Man. and went, you know, did a tour for, I don't know, it was about a week or two or something. So, I mean, it's been all over. Um, and it probably spent its life in a set of fiber cases, you know, nothing fancy like we have today with, you know, padding and, you know, all this stuff, you know, these were tools. These weren't collectibles. These were tools. And so they spent a lot of time rattling around in, um, in fiber cases, uh, being set up and torn down by, you know, various people, um, not necessarily all drummers or whatever. I mean, just, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. so it, you know, it's, it's held up remarkably well. The, the wraps in really good shape. There's a few little splits along some of the seams due to the moisture that it, it sustained, but most of the die cast parts are still in decent shape. The chrome is still pretty nice. Uh, the claws and, and tees, um, this is a better part of those are made out of steel. Chrome plating is a good rust representative, but it doesn't, you know, it's not 100%. And you s- stick something in a damp basement, especially if there's some sort of flood, um, yeah. you know, so there's a lot of uh, surface rust and, and just flat out rust on the claws and the tees. The handles are made out of brass on those uh, old school ones. Uh, there's wear on the center part of the, uh, the barrel because they're like balls on the end and a little uh, cylindrical flat spot in the middle. Uh, Brooks refers to these as the barrel handles. Barrel um, center. Barrel center handles. Yeah. There's... You see raw brass hmm. on the tips, sure, uh, and they're kind of spindly uh, from where they uh, tighten against the claw. It's about maybe three eighths of an inch, just continuing tension rod. We all know what the the diameter of a tension rod yep. is, and then that fits into the T handle. Those things, a lot of them are bent uh, a little bit, not terribly, but it's like you know yeah. these these things have been all over the world. And it's as I'm, I'm assuming. I'm going back to 1955. Let's call it it's round down or up here a little bit. The drum sets basically are about 70 years old now. Right. At, at that, right. you know, ish. Right. So right. let's give her a break. Yeah. And we don't know, <laughs> we, you know, 
we don't have the history how it came into this gentleman's possession. That so, was a question is how did he so, get this? How did he get Ed Shaughnessy's yeah. drums? He's just a collector, yeah. I guess. And there's there's a thread on, on vintage drum form and a lot of people were offering opinions and thoughts and everything. And somebody brought up the guy's name because there was apparently an article uh, because of the whole lawn art thing. There was a news, there's a video uh, people talking about how they were sad to see all these uh, lawn art go because it's been there for so long and yeah. it's been a landmark and all that. That name was out there. So somebody posted all that. Um, and then another well-known collector, you know, very well-known in the community, posted that he had known this guy uh, about 10 or 15 years ago hmm. and that his stuff was usually legit and... Uh, Really, he collected really nice stuff, and he said, "You know, whoever got it scored." Yeah, uh, just based on that. So, um, you know, but we great. don't know anything other than that. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and the fa- the way you say it's to get that uh, kind of backing from someone means that if it wasn't authentic, it would mean that he didn't do that on purpose. He wasn't selling some fake drum set. It's it's more right. He, he thought it was real too. Um, right. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, this guy apparently had some really nice stuff, according to this other collector, at, you know, at one time. So, yeah. you know, this was not, you know, some completely random person, although um, not well known. Um, sure. But, uh, you know, so how he came to possess this set, um, the Shaughnessy set is a little less of a mystery because that's a lot newer set uh, it's a modular era ludwig so you know that's not 70 years ago yeah yeah, yeah. um but uh so when i got there i uh i asked the the, the guys uh he's still alive and he's actually in a nursing home um which is why they were liquidating his estate and i spoke to his sister and i said so how did how did he come to uh you know to own this these two sets um and she said, well, he, you know, he collected, he bought uh, from a couple of dealers. He said one was California and I can't remember what the other one, I was thinking Ohio, but then w- when Brooks and I were talking, he just, he, he mentioned a guy, a uh, very well-known vintage dealer that was in Connecticut, right? Brooks? Yeah. Hmm. Charlie Donnelly. Uh, yeah. Charlie Donnelly, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. Uh, so it's like, maybe she said Connecticut. I, I don't remember. I was... Yeah, yeah. I was very tired. <laughs> just driven a long time, yeah. and was uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So you know, so interesting. That seems to be, you know, probably maybe a pretty likely scenario. But yeah, one way or the other, he acquired this set um, along with a lot of other stuff over the years, and then uh, it just seemed, you know, I don't know. It seems like the, the maybe the collection kind of got away from him. That happens. Um, I mean, this is some Smithsonian yeah. level stuff, but also it yeah. sounds like he had a lot of stuff that maybe you kind of forget what you have and you forget that right. it's in the basement. And geez. Right. Um, and the thing is, uh, you know, like I said, in the pictures and the auction pictures, I knew there was water damage. There was a picture or two where you could see in the background, this big heaping pile of fiber cases. A lot of them look very wrinkly and water damaged. And then they had a lot of, uh, you know, there was one lot that was selling some cases, but it was just a few. Yeah. So way more in this pile that they did not sell. It's like clearly this stuff was in cases, but there was some, you know, probably in the basement, probably some sort of yeah. drug situation. Yeah. Anyway, so once I get this set, I realized that uh, the batter head's missing off the bass drum, which I already knew that going in here. Sure. The resonant is off the floor, Tom. Um so it became very apparent that it was sitting face down, either on the floor or in a case. The 20 was placed inside, resting on the back side of that head, you know, the GK head. Yep, yep. Uh, then the 13 was placed inside the 20. Uh, I think the snare must have gotten some better storage because it doesn't have nearly any issues that these other ones do. So anyway, and this is a calfskin head. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's stretching and tightening and stretching. 
people believe, oh, these things, you know, you look at them wrong, they would just, you know, disintegrate if you hit them too hard. <laughs> they're quite, du- they're quite durable. Yeah, it's and skin. It could, couldn't be that. farther from the truth. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, and this, these drums are heavy. So, um, you know, not really the best way to store an important drum set, but a lot of his drum sets were missing a head. The, I think that was just the way he was nesting things yeah. so he could keep them stored. And uh, unfortunately, you know, in this case, this one got got really wet for a, I don't know how long. Yeah. Long enough to break the glue joints on the uh, the front hoop and to completely dismem- you know, dismantle the uh, front re-ring from the head. Wow. Or from the shell. Yeah. So, uh, well, and rust everything, so. That's unbelievable. And uh, there's more to hear about it, but I want to jump over real quick and just kind of like, he, let's hear from Brooks a little bit about this. And um, as we're going, I think now might be a good time. Let's rewind 70 years. And can we hear a little bit about this drum set when it was, you know, going around the world with Gene? Like, let's hear a little bit more about that. And then we'll get into how you authenticated and some of that process, which you explained a little bit more. But um, what, what is the, 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 the background of this iconic drum set? It was clearly a brand new set, 54. 54 was a banner year for the company because that was when the whole design of the lug casings and the rims changed, and they went to a different style. This Hmm. set uh, came into Gene's hands sometime in 54, and I have pictures of Gene in two different club venues that I put in the book. One of them he's playing what he had up until the point where he got this new set. And the at, at, in the book, I speculate about, I wonder if all they did was just swap the hardware from beaver tail casings to the new stuff. And mm-hmm. of course, no, they didn't do that. But the predecessor to, to Steve's bass drum was built the same way. The legs were attached to the back. And actually, they were originally George Way style legs um also as i point out in the book they were you know it was sort of the the gull wing design but it was george the george way catalogs when they first appeared um but they were in the same place back on the batter side of the drum and the front head was the same head but yet had yet to get the slingerland arch over the top but it's the same drum head that was added later when that became something Slingerland was trying to do. And I have theories sure. about that too. So the drum set was his main set from that point until he changed to Tom Toms with the smaller lug casings somewhere around 59 or 60. But the bass drum up until that point, maybe even after, was the same thing. It was the original, you know, barrel center, T-rods, et cetera, et cetera, legs in the back. And then he switched after that to the more typical 24 where the leg spurs were Slingerland and they were in the, again, on the front of the shell. Hmm. What he got was 20 by 20 because he had started using that style bait floor tom in the late 40s, well before. He had gone down from a 26 to a 24. He'd been using a 12 by 24 prior to that. But then he got this set, and it was brand new in the, in the early 50s somewhere. And then he switched over in 54 to the newer style hardware, probably out of obligation yeah, uh, more than anything else, because that's the kind of guy he was. Um, so the set became his main set, and it went everywhere. As Steve said, it was all over the world, hundreds of venues here in the States, Australia, films record dates as a matter of fact a lot of people's favorite krupa album is the one called drummer man yeah this set was used for that entire album unbelievable Um, and it's on the cover of the drum and man book which i have a copy of downstairs that's when i saw that i was like oh my god that's awesome yeah and if i'm not mistaken krupa and rich that album right yes so yeah i mean this it's it's extremely iconic set because it was the one he used most of the time, if not all the time, unless it was a rental. 
he did use rentals for at least three years. Um, the different Tom starts showing up in 57. So, you know, I, I think it was at least three years, but off and on he may have used pieces of it later. It's hard to tell really, but he was usually pretty consistent about sticking with whatever was current. Yeah. So it'd be um, 55 to like 58. I would say 54. Oh, that was 54 to what, 57. Okay. That's when, that's when the new design, a lot of people gotcha. yep. have gotten that wrong. It's the, the new design for the hardware actually came out in 54 and retailers would get a letter from Slingerland saying, here's the new hardware. And that hmm. letter was dated August of 1954. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a copy of one. So anyway, so yeah, 54 to 57 is the, the less detailed range of when Gene used that set. And as we said, he used it everywhere. In learning about some of the things that were done with the set, I can understand why, because it dealt with a number of problems. Steve can probably get into it better. but So, unbelievably iconic set that luckily, you know, it's it's been saved. Yeah. I mean, I will say that Brooks, as as someone who you, I'm sure you wanted to win this drum set. I mean, <laughs> I, <laughs> but but we've joked that it's, uh, you know, that's some. Sometimes if you don't win an auction, it can be a uh, okay. Now I don't have to like sell my car to go buy this thing or something. Well, I, I I do have to say that I was tipped off about this auction before it even started by a good friend of mine named Bob Cianci, and Bob sent me a note that said, "Did you know this was going on?" And this was all preliminary auction information, like for a week. So I'm sitting here, I'm all set. I got everything scoped out and I'm sweating bullets for the beginning of this thing. <laughs> it's like, come on, come on, come on. Let's go. Here. Yeah. In the process of bidding over, I guess, what was it, Steve, a week's time that the auction yeah, was went week, on? Week, week, week and a half. Something. I made two phone calls to the auction people and I found out halfway through, and this is when everything Steve had mention it he may not have known it but somebody clued them in to what they were selling they had oh, no boy. idea and somebody obviously said you guys have a gene krupa drum set there you know you need to up your game as far as displaying <laughs> that and then i guess that's when it got separated from all the remo stuff because originally it was listed with all these other junk drums i'd be curious to find out what happened to that tricks on snare do you know i noticed a tricks in like a uh, little T behind in the picture. And I was like, Hey, yeah. I wonder where that went. Yeah. I have it. it they, that all that stuff they, stayed. Oh, with they, kept that, one, they kept that lot. Good. Okay. There was, there was one leopard skin, uh, two blug snare drum that got pulled out. Wow. Early on. Really? But all that other <laughs> stuff. Yeah. I have all that other Great. stuff. Great. Well, good luck with that then. <laughs> Bonus. Yeah. 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 Anyway, um, taking up space. So it was, she told me that, yeah, somebody had contacted them and told them what they had and what they were selling. And at that point, all of a sudden, I watched the bidding go berserk, you know? And it was like, okay, yep. so much for me ever getting near this thing. And I had good friends of mine that have a lot more money than I do going, oh, come on, man, go for it, go for it. And I'm going, I'm already past what I could ever afford. <laughs> but it was, it was frustrating but fun at the same time. So, But you, know, you have to feel good about this drum set being in the world. Oh yeah. You know absolutely. what I mean? As a historian, sure. it's just a great thing. Sure, yeah. And it's great that someone like Steve, who's doing a great thing with it and, and bringing it, you know, doing the right, doing it the right way. Um, right. It's great for all of us. Well, just to know it's there. as we all know, we're only caretakers of this stuff for a, a certain period of time. And after that, hopefully it goes to another caretaker. Um, but as we also know, Museums are not that interested in drums. Um, some stuff has re re of genes has recently gone to the PAS people, and that's great, but it might be years before anyone ever sees it. Um, sure. And, of course, lots of talk about Charlie's collection being a museum, which I believe is what will happen. So, but, you know, how many drum museums are there going to be? Not many, and, you know... Yeah. A museum's going to accept a donation. They're not going to buy something. It's frustrating, uh, yeah. but that's the reality of it. It is, but this is museum quality pieces where uh, it, it 
again, just to know it's out there, to know that it's been saved right. and because give it, you know, a couple more years, who knows the, the house could have gotten, so something could have, there could have been a flood. It could have been just completely lost to time. The house could have burnt oh, down. Yeah, right. God forbid. It's just like, uh, well, that's the, uh, that's the main, the main reason I wrote the book was that very fact that we don't know about the stuff we haven't found, but yeah. at least we know some of what is there. And hopefully if somebody reads the book, and they see this thing, they go, wait a minute, this is in the book. I, you know, somebody should do something. It's like the, the 9 by 13 that Bennett was selling for years and, had, and told the anecdote about it having been stolen from the, uh, the back, the uh, whatever, the loading dock of the Palladium or wherever it was. Sure. Turns out that was a perfect connection, and it was actually true. But nobody's going to believe it unless they look into it. So, and there yeah. was that drum, which, of course, yeah. our mutual friend Joe also has now. We're talking about Joe Lanny. Um, okay. Joe's Lucky got a, fella. Joe, yeah, he's got a lot of great stuff. Buddy stuff. Now he's got uh, Shaughnessy's drums. He's got bunches of Krupa stuff. But he's, he, Joe is going to take care of this stuff. You know, it's not just him. Yeah. It, buying it to turn around and flip it somewhere he's buying it because he considers it important it so, is important yeah caretaker is a great way to put it yeah. um steve let me ask you there's some special modifications to this drum set that brooks mentioned to me what are these modifications i'm excited to hear yeah uh well brooks uh, informed me that these you know this set you know as we know traveled all over the world a lot of times the people setting them up were you know it wasn't gene it was you know, some stage hand or just, you know, whatever, yeah. a non-drummer. So um, these modifications made it a lot easier for somebody who doesn't know drums to set things up as close to the same every time. Uh, one is the floor tom legs. Uh, they're just straight legs, but about halfway up, there's a groove cut in them. And that groove fits perfectly uh the old Tom uh, leg holders, it's a, a bent steel bracket, just out of flat bar steel with some holes drilled through it. And it's got an eye bolt affair and a wing nut. And that's what, you know, you put it through the holes, the, we, the, the eye bolt provides your tension, holds your leg up. Well, these allow you to put the leg to the right position and that little eye bolt will go down in that group. That's interesting. This is like very, very early. Uh, it's like pre memory lock right, right now. People yeah. would have the memory locks. Yeah, but exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Interesting. And so then the brackets on the, the bass drum, uh, that hold the cymbal arms, uh, they're your standard Slingerland, uh, brackets of the era that, uh, were made out of, again, made out of flat bar steel, everything. Most things back then were fabricated from that. We didn't get into die cast, a lot of die cast parts till more in the sixties. Um, and from all the pictures, like, Oh, just, that's just a garden variety Slingerland, uh, bracket. Uh, it had a little, uh, had pressed knobs on it. And people usually refer to this as a telephone dial, um, a ratchet system, like is we, we see on, uh, rail consulates sure. from the sixties. And there's a, there's, there's one or more holes on the little bracket that clamps on the L rod for your symbol arm. And then you can rotate it depending on what, how you want. Well, anyway, I pull this off. One of them was one of the little clamps was missing, but I see there's a little notch cut in the side of the bracket and the little knobs are all flattened out. And I look at the bracket that holds the L arm and it's not the standard one because the standard one is just curved along the edge there where the two parts kind of come together and then the wing nut goes through. Well, this one comes down and it's got a 90 degree angle on it and it fits perfectly in that slot. So it can only fit on that bracket one way. There's no yeah. way you could rotate it and change it. So that was clearly a modification to make it, you know. And that yeah. was that one's critical because it was a, somebody's brilliant idea that Slingerland, had they not been right on the verge of changing to a whole different style of cymbal rod holder, they probably would have adapted that themselves because that the, the clamp 
that Steve is talking about that the symbol rod goes through. The original ones with had the, you know, they, they had corresponding holes and nibs that, you know, the two pieces go together. They're supposed to yep. lock in together. They rarely did. But with this one, having that lip and that notch in the base plate meant that thing could never go anywhere, and we, yeah. which is brilliant because we're talking about two pieces of steel locking together and being tightened down by a wing nut. They should have done that with all of them, you know? Well, yeah, instead of it slowly falling and then get each time, it'll right. never be as tight right. as it was. And, and, and bear in yeah. mind that Gene was using a 24-inch ride symbol in those days. <laughs> So any yeah, support, and this huge. is probably why it happened, any yeah. support that he could get for keeping that thing in the same place was important. Yeah. What's really cool, too, is that you can set these drums up to be exactly the height and the way Gene had them, which is kind of another layer of, like, you know, yeah. Krupa yeah. coolness. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that along with the, uh, the uh, you know, the spurs being mounted on the batter side. Yep. Uh you know, those, I mean, I didn't realize, I did not realize the situation with the floor tom legs from the auction. And I didn't realize the other one because I'm like sending pictures to Brooks and I'm like sending me a prepare to have your mind blown. And here's the pictures of this bracket. Uh, and it was the the little bracket with the, the lip that hangs over. That was a standard a WNA part on a different clamp that somebody said, well, you know what, This we can take these two pizzas and make them work better than what we currently sell. Well, I think I mentioned to you a while back, Steve, that the ones, the symbol bracket holders that Gene used in the 40s and up until the early 50s were just a flat bar. The, yeah. the, the raised center bracket didn't actually appear until the late 40s. And Gene already had a lot of drums that he was using. And that particular flat bar had a clamp similar to what's on there now. So I'm right. sure that's probably where the idea came from. And as you mentioned, the lip that fits over is actually shorter. So it's, it right. only fits over the, the thickness of the flat bar. That's as far as it went. But it was the same right. kind of clamp. Right, yeah. yeah. You can tell that somebody ground it to be flush and made the edges the corners a little round yeah. so somebody put a lot of yeah it's just and it's this, you can tell this was yeah it was done after it was plated oh so yeah. it wasn't like made this way somebody modified it yeah after the fact so well gene is we like a, he, he's a uh he's like a, an r d department in many ways for zildjian and for slingerland where he Very would be true. out there testing yeah. them he's the guy so he, you know yeah, these yeah. symbols need to be heavier they need to be lighter this needs to be this this is falling on me and <laughs> right. yeah. yeah very cool yeah i had listened to a, an interview the other day where he was talking about how he you know did consulting work for slingerland that you know he would test things and they would you know get his feedback and stuff and uh so well it's like yeah that kind of makes sense if he was you know he was their number one guy uh, on all their catalogs for many many years and never deviated from using slingerland um and he so he was in the field he was the guy you know a good guy to test things out although there are there are plenty of examples of stuff gene did not use <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and i i have it on good information that much of that was because he didn't like them or he didn't need them. Um, yeah. You know, that goes was to show he plays case. what he liked. Yeah. And he kept it too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all of the Gene Krupa branded stuff in the Slingerland catalogs, most of it, he didn't play anything remotely like it. Well, I mean, this snare drum has the three point strainer, a standard butt on the other end, and no bridges. That was his favorite model, which he yeah, used so. most, he used all the way through the 30s and 40s. And that, I think a lot of that's because of his where he started when he was playing a 10 2 blug artist model snare when he joined Benny's band. And that was 1934. So he didn't want to fuss with extension brackets or any of that stuff. So he would literally just take them off. That was his signature model drum. And he never used that kind of drum that often. Once in a while, he did. As a matter of fact, the snare drum that followed yours um is indeed a snare of the 153 i think it was 
that has the extension brackets. It was the Gene Krupa signature model. Um, so he did once in a while use them, but right. not yeah. that often. But you had the you had the clamshell strainer, which is I have I have a Radio King with one of those. It's a dreadful design. I mean, it's just terrible. <laughs> so no wonder he didn't use it. Right. But you know they were the the Gene Krupa models for a while. There had a clamshell right. uh, strainer. So, but you know. That's, That's pretty common, are, though. You see the yeah. guitarist who's not using his signature guitar because it's three hundred dollars, and <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> very true. And and one thing we got to talk about too, a few things is just the uh, the the rash kind of stuff on this drum set, which adds so much coolness to it. The cowbell rash where his cowbell was just from getting played, right. and Gene's cowbell was very iconic. I mean, it's it's just neat to see that. You know, I'm sure it's just taking on, taking off, taking on, taking off yep. year after year. It's just uh, it's neat. Yep. And then also there's the chrome loss on the um, the throw off there. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's just heavy. Yeah. use. Yeah. I mean, I was I was like I said, when I first looked at it in that garage, it's like, oh, man, I don't know if the strainer has been replaced or something because the chrome on the knob and stuff looked too good. Uh, and then I was looking at it a couple days ago. I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know about that strainer. And then I got up real close to it. Uh, with a magnifying glass, I was like, "Oh wait, this isn't perfect." Yeah. And look, right on the edge there, where his thumb went, there's chrome worn off. <laughs> so you know, it's 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 a surreal experience. Yeah. Uh, I'll go. I you know, I'll take a look at these things. It's like it's just the history of this thing. I mean, it's just objects. But if these things could talk, sure. All the famous musicians they were. He, he bat and he played with right. with this drum set it's very cool yeah. there's a picture of, Bu of buddy noodling on right. it and who knows else right. uh you know they go on these jazz at the philharmonic all-star tours and stuff and you know any number of people could have sat behind this set yeah uh you know i mean a lot of these pictures show you know household names that you know most people would know dizzy gillespie and one of his dear friends, Roy Eldridge, was on a lot of those. You know, Lionel Hampton. Right. There's, you know, video of him and Benny Goodman and Teddy Wilson, the three of them. I guess Benny, Teddy, and uh, and Gene in late 54. Well, and then it was in the Benny Goodman story. Right. But all of the famous musicians that made cameos or, rep or played themselves in that movie yeah. That were in the presence of this drum, even though we're just miming along to playback. Uh, it's just if this these drums could talk, yeah, the stories they could tell. Yeah, yeah absolutely incredible. Brooks, I want to ask you, was this a pretty much like like not a year and a half authentication process? I mean, Steve acquired these drums June 21st, 2023, or that's when the auction ended. Like, was this a pretty much pretty a pretty quick process of of doing the authenticating or i mean you've done it enough to know these drums you have well, you wrote the I, book I, on it but. i will say that i was convinced that these were gene's drums before the auction even started wow so okay. um and steve actually did most of the the difficult work in tracking down things like photographs and reference material and actually looking and working on the drums so for yeah. me this was much easier and most of the time, it was just me saying, yeah, that's it. Yeah, you're right. You know, <laughs> so, so, yeah, it was it took a lot less time, but that's mostly because Steve was doing a lot of the work. That leads to the question of what you're doing is the process of cleaning them leading into maybe as we kind of wrap up here, what your final kind of goal with this drum set would be. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm taking care of things like the rust on the T rods. I'm trying to conserve things without, you know, some of them were quite rusty. Uh, there's a, a process a lot of people use. There was a gentleman on one of a couple of the forums named Mike who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, or I guess last year in a motorcycle accident. I think he was the originator of soaking rusty metal chrome parts in Dawn dishwashing detergent and water, hmm. a, a high concentration of Dawn. And so that's what I've done on those is soak them, scrub them gently with a brass brush back in to get as much of the rust off. So it's not doing any damage, but there's plating loss. You can see copper underneath uh, off the chrome. There's some places where it's all gone. So 
things where it's not going to continue to deteriorate, but the the patina is still there. Um, a couple of the tea or the, of the claws are really, really, really rough, but I'm not going to replace them because they're part of the history no. of this. Thing. Yeah. So I think it's um, a, it's a it's terminology would be museums would say preservation as opposed to restoration. So right. this yeah, is exactly. definitely a preservation mission. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking anything off the drums unless they needed to come off. I took pictures of where the washers were clocked because they all say Slingerland Chicago on them. Oh, cool. Uh, <laughs> you know, a few things I've had to take off for various reasons, but they've all gone back in the same exact spot. Uh, I'm just trying to preserve it as best I can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, what so, do you put, is this going to be kind of just set up in your house or uh, do you have any big goal to like display it anywhere or are you kind of taking it day by day? Not really sure. Uh, I mean, when I saw the state that these things were in the auction, uh, you know, they needed they needed a home. Yeah, uh, they clearly weren't in in great shape. They weren't being stored correctly. Uh, I felt like me between me and, uh, you know, some some other people I know. You know, I could get this thing back to where it's no longer deteriorating, uh, not going to fall apart, and will be there for future generations. Um, beyond that, I haven't got a lot, given it a lot of thought. I, you know, I would like to, I would like for it to be able to the public to be able to see it in some capacity. But you know, as Brooke said, it's like, you know, there's not a ton of interest in that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I don't really know. Um, yeah. I'm still, still kind of wrapping my head around the whole thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's uh, not been very long, so you can still just enjoy them. And- <laughs> yeah. And, it, and there's still repairs need to be done. Yeah. The re-ring needs to be reattached. There's some separation. Uh, you know, I kind of feel like the set, you know, in, in Raiders of the Lost Ark, after the Nazis have captured the Ark and they have it in that crate with all their insignias on it and it's on, the, on that U-boat and then, you know, good versus evil burns that <laughs> the Nazi symbols off. I kind of feel like this set was determined not to deteriorate and yes. fall apart because <laughs> given the amount of, I mean, I think this thing was sitting in a couple of inches of water. Could have been, oh, yeah. Man. Wow. Based on the condition of the, you know, all the wood parts on the front. So, and, and who knows how long. Uh, so, you know, it could have very easily deteriorated to the point where it wasn't recognizable if that head had been head had have been thrown away, uh, it was just another drum old drum set to somebody. So, I, th- I think there's even something a little more special to it ver- with you buying it in that shape, looking at those pictures of it in the yard, as opposed to you buying it in maybe the shape it is now, where it's been set up and and there's pictures of it. Something pretty cool about buying this pile of drums that has needs to be saved you know what i mean like there's something very special about like you you got it it's been saved it's not you're not the second guy to like get his hands on it and and like brooke says i really subscribe to that you know unless you're immortal these things will pass to someone else at some point Uh, so i'm merely a caretaker at this point i can do what i can do to preserve them uh, at some point, these will pass to someone else. And I think uh, I think I those people are out there, too. I had a great conversation with a young guy yesterday who's just now starting to play on his own Radio King drum set that his father got for him. And he's, uh, he's a great kid. So this will be somebody that, you know, is going to be in a position down the road to see something like that available and jump on it. So, which I'm glad to see. It didn't seem like the present generation was that interested in collecting anything. So, you know, but this this is somebody who might be. Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised. That's um, stuff like this. And there's a lot of, I mean, the drum drummers are different. We love, as, as we all know, we love stuff like this. I mean, this is... Right. I, there's like the dream of finding like, like I look on like the Goodwill auction website, like people do and you find an Acrolyte and you're like, Oh, it's 50 bucks. <laughs> That's like right. the layer one of this is of, of uh, the hunt layer two is you find like a, uh, you know, a black beauty somewhere, which is mind boggling. Yeah. This is the ultimate. This is like layer a hundred of yeah. like, it cannot get 
I mean, this is as as dream level of a find as it as it gets. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So for, congrats yeah. to you, Steve. I mean, this is just Thanks. unbelievable. And I'll say that when I, you know, I obviously everybody knew who Buddy was. Uh, you know, Gene died in '73. Buddy died in you know the I guess the early '80s. '87. '87. So, eight, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I grew up seeing. Uh, buddy on tonight show on the mike douglas show you know all the talk shows so i knew who he was and i knew he was just, just this amazing drummer but i didn't know who gene was at that point um and i heard about him over the years i bought a one of the jazz at the philharmonic uh, albums it was a, a drum battle between him and buddy and thought oh this is kind of neat and then, uh, I don't know, in the 90s, I was in a library and I stumbled across Drummer Man. You know, they, you could check it out. And then they also had uh, the, the, uh, the Many Goodman story. So I checked those out, watched them because I knew Gene was in, in that. And uh, so I watched that and was like, oh, wow, this, there's Gene and there, you know, all this stuff. And, and then I listened to that album, and the, uh, that album is, you know, it's recorded in 55, so the sound quality is really good. Yeah. Quincy Jones's very first arranging job, as a matter of fact. Yeah, mm. and there's a one of the pictures that I provided. There's Quincy standing right next to it with Gene looking over the charts. Right. Amazing, yeah. And then so I went out and bought a bunch of other CDs back in the days when we bought CDs. I went to Best Buy and bought everything that's – any kind of Gene Krupa or Benny Goodman compilation. And some of them were just unlistenable because it sounded like somebody bought an old scratched up record <laughs> at Goodwill and then recorded it and put a compilation of them on, on a CD. And so over the years, a lot of official recordings have been released. A lot of that earlier stuff sounds a lot better than I thought it was going to. Sure. But I got my start listening to that album and watching this movie and this drum set is in that movie and is used for that album. Right. There's, so a, there's an omen just, there. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, that's another thing that blows my mind. Uh, never in my wildest dream did I think that I'd own this thing. Yeah. You can't think that. You can't ever Or that dream it even that. was still out there. What do you yeah. mean? I think that every day. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, well, we need to change the way we think about everything. Yeah. Okay. Well, well I was yeah. listening. I was re-listening to one of y'all's podcasts. Uh, I think, and you were talking about Charlie's find and, uh, you know, all the stuff that was found. And, and Brooke said, I don't, you asked, do you think there's anything else out there? And Brooke said, I don't think there's any other complete sets out there. I was thinking about that well, when he said that. Okay. Yeah. And Hopefully I said, not that I know of. <laughs> yeah, not that <laughs> like, know Definitively, of, no yeah, more. Right. That, and that, <laughs> yeah. Well, we, you, you never know. Stuff turns up all the time. Right. Yeah. And at this time, when I was listening to this, this auction was taking place and i was like man you just never know yep. wow you never know that's what's true. out there that's true absolutely so. yes i mean i the that episode in particular which led to me becoming friends with don mccauley which led to me getting to see the particular the bass drum that was at the uh, jeans bass drum that was at the 2019 chicago drum show putting my hand on it, feeling that gene energy, which that l led to meeting Charlie Watts was just this. I, I, there's something and my grandpa grew up in new Rochelle, New York. Oh. So it, he always talked about meeting gene as a younger guy. He took lessons with George Wetling and, and, you know, I never knew, you know, grandpas tend to, uh, you know, exaggerate a little bit, but the more I heard things, I was like, man, maybe he did meet him a few times and play around in the, in the New York area. I've always had this connection with Gene uh, in some capacity, and that's been taken to the you know to the next level through my many conversations with Brooks. So the, I have been so excited all week yeah. since Brooks texted me to do this conversation with you guys, and and it's just unbelievable. So I'm I'm so honored to have uh, had this chance to to speak with you. And Steve, you'll have to keep us updated on on. As it as it gets you know cleaner and cleaner and you get it you know maybe set up or are you going to put symbols on it you think and if you like display it is that kind of are you at that point of thinking about it? Yeah, I mean I've been looking online, you know all the symbol stands and the L arms for the symbols and stuff and it's like, um, you know I guess I'm going to ask 
<laughs> Brooks, <laughs> you have anything to sell? <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, you know, I mean, the stuff's out there, but it's, you know, it's hard. It doesn't come up every day. So, it, per, and I don't want to. In particular, the stuff that Gene had with that set. Um, I, right. I can tell you that, yes, I've got plenty of Wahlberg and Auger 502 hi hat stands, which is what he's using with that set. But uh, the symbol stands, I'm not sure. I'd have to look. Mm. Yeah, you know. So well, we'll 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 talk later. But, right, uh, and then you got to find a can. You, know, you got to find a canister throne somewhere too, and that big fat. Yeah, there is one out there, but yeah, <laughs> but it's uh, you know, I I don't have the money right. to buy all that stuff right yeah. now. Yeah, you've I'm concentrating on. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like <laughs> Mrs. Steve has given you enough uh, leeway to buy this drum set that you, you yeah. don't need to. <laughs> I've given her a lot of rope. I don't want to give her any more. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, this is just incredible, guys. And I, I want to mention, because I, I don't think it, it, it did well. I was telling Brooks before. Uh, Brooks and I did a uh, breakdown of the Gene Krupa story, which was only on YouTube. So if you're listening to this as a podcast episode, it was not available on the audio platforms. And that video is at 11,000 views, which Brooks and I are both kind of astonished <laughs> at. But it's it's a really, really cool look. It's like 45 minutes of a breakdown of everything that's wrong with that movie yeah. where Gene's playing World War II era drums before the war even happened and things like that and uh, yeah. all kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to plug that because Brooks did a great job on that yeah. and uh, well, many I of his episodes, um, which I will link all of them in the description. Cool. Because as Steve can attest, Brooks knows his stuff and he's it's oh, it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's just great to hear someone who's so knowledgeable about um, so much uh, gene info. So I will link to all that stuff in the description. But uh, Brooks, can people get your book anywhere? Is that available in print or on, as on digital? As far as I know, it's still available on. But it's always available through Rob Cook's publishing company. Rebeats. Okay. Rebeats. Yep. Um, I. Uh, Someone said not long ago that it's still available on Amazon for a while. Basically, until until this pressing run is done, it's still available. But after that, it's out of print completely. It's It'll be digital. Digital, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, Rob will still have that with yeah. the, um, what you might call the Hudson. Okay. Hudson, yeah. yeah. Yep. And it's a great book. It really is. Thank I you. didn't. I didn't. Ha I did not have it before all of this, um, but I I quickly bought it after this because yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a great reference material piece of reference material. And if you're a you know if you nerd out on this kind of detail stuff, uh, you know no one's gonna ever touch that. Well, I'm actually so. working on supplements now, which would include your whole thing, um, but other stuff that's come to light since the. Uh, since I, you know, since the book came out, and I'm I'm still tr trying to prod my good friend over in the UK, Jerry Brennan, to start working on compiling jazz at the Philharmonic um, sheets because that stuff is a total mess, and a lot of what we found here with photographs would have been much easier to date if the JATP documentation had been better done. You know, mm. so sure it'll help everybody, but he's busy all the time. But anyway, yeah, well, I love that. This is I, I think the same thing with John Bonham, with Ringo, with Buddy Rich. This is living, breathing history where things I just did the Simmons drum history where they, they were going, you know, the Steve Graham who wrote the book was saying that, like, it's his, his book was the complete guide to Simmons drums. And he said it's incomplete. Because new stories came out on that episode yeah. that he hadn't had in the book. And it's it's true with all this where things just keep coming out. Uh, and that's the most fun of all this is, you know, every year something new seems to uh, surface. So it's always something to look forward to. Well, and Russ Connor, who published the books on Benny Goodman's history, he had to wind up publishing three extra books because of all the stuff that came out later. So I don't have the yeah. I don't have the money for that. So <laughs> I'll, I'll just yeah, digital's easier because you can just upload a new file. I'm I'm assuming, but yeah. um, well, uh, this is great, guys. I, so I'll put the link in the description for uh, Brooks's episodes and the book. Um, Steve, is there anything you want to where you know people want to find you or share anything? I'll put all the pictures that you've provided in the the. Uh, on my website with this and it'll be on the YouTube. You know, if you've seen the video, you've been seeing them, but I'll provide them so everyone can see 
uh, the photos you provided. But beyond that, is there anything you want to say as we uh, wind down here? Uh, not really. Uh, you know, I'm not looking to be famous here or anything, but, um, you know, the, the set's not for sale. Um, <laughs> that's good. I like to hear that. So though. yeah, it's not for sale. So, um, and, uh, you know, thanks to Brooks. I mean, he's, you know, he's a man after my own heart, uh, who, you know, I nerd out all over these kind of details and look at pictures and all that kind of stuff. And he's been a, uh, you know, I would say he's a, been a great friend so far, even though we, this is the first time we've seen each other. And, uh, you know, buy his book. Uh, if you can't get a hold of the, the physical book, buy the digital book, because it's, it's a great read, even if you don't like to read, if you just like the pictures. <laughs> Look at the I pictures. Mean, it's, I mean, you can, I you mean, can jump to a page and just find something interesting. And that's kind yeah, of, I, I mean, mean, it's it's really a thick book. <laughs> yeah, it, it's okay, a great you get, book. You guys are making uh, me blush now. Come on, let's talk about, <laughs> well, talk about something you know, I mean, seriously, it is it is a great book. So, no, thank uh, you. Uh, yep. Um, I'm, you know, I'm grateful for all the work he's done to help, uh, you know, document the other stuff that's been found and disprove the stuff that's not real. And, uh, it's, you know, he's been an invaluable resource to carry on Gene's legacy because, you know, Gene, Gene was my guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I found him late in life, but, uh, as much as I like Buddy Rich, um, Gene was a, a, just a good and decent soul. Yeah. Uh, I've never heard anybody that had anything bad to say about him. Uh, his, he put his heart and his essence into the, his playing. And I think that's why, uh, people loved him. Yeah. Loved his playing, reacted to his playing. I was w- watching the, uh, the DCI video about a buddy that's got Louis Belson in it. And he's talking about Gene. and he talked about how buddy would get up there and just do some impossible, you know, thing that buddy could do. And then Gene would do something far simpler but more musical and people would go crazy yeah yeah and here what he's doing from a technical standpoint it's not anything close to what buddy could do but gene just put his heart and soul into what he played and whenever you see him playing he's got a smile on his face yep and part of that might be the showman in him but it, it just seems it seems real to me yeah he enjoyed playing music and playing drums and he did till the day he died. Yeah. Yeah. He embodies so, the like jazz drummer man, you know, thirties, forties, fifties. If I yeah. pictured that it would be Gene to me. Yeah. It's, it's just the, and yes, buddy. And I, I love buddy and buddy's just a technical right. jaw dropping, you know, it's, it's incredible, but there's something very special about Gene. I think we all agree with that. And if I think, people are right, watching this and they're, I think buddy would yeah. agree with that. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So uh, I echo everything Steve said about Brooks. He he knows how I feel about him, and I'm very lucky to have him as a friend. And uh, Steve, I appreciate you sharing your time and, and bringing this, you know, to light. And this is I've had 200 whatever, 10 plus episodes, and this is like a landmark episode for me. I got to wow. say, after this many years of doing it, bringing stuff like this to light is like what it's all about. And I think everyone's going to enjoy it. So um I really appreciate you guys being here and, uh, you know, Steve, good luck with everything with it. Brooks, uh, always a pleasure, my friend. We'll have to do it again. As I tell everybody, Bart, you do great work here. Thank you. Yeah, man. It's a great podcast and uh, always something to learn. uh, And I I listen to it every week. Still working, still working the back catalog. uh, But yeah, it's, it's a great, it's great to listen and great to watch the ones that are on video. Those are great too. Yeah. So great. Well, thank you. Yeah, Thanks to both you guys. Thank you, man. Thank you.